everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of TED Excellence, the show in which we find out how best to learn by being friends. And I come to you live from my Corona Bunker on the moon with Dog Cat Fox, a Pepper Jack, and all of you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Saturday, scintillating Saturday. Uh, we return once more to Ted Ed. And no, I'm not talking about a talking horse. I'm talking about Ted Educator Talks. Uh, it's been a while since I've done one of these. It's been a while since I've done something on education specifically. So I thought it might be a, a good time to dive back into it. And what is today's title? Well, educators must be more than allies. Um, I thought educators needed to be educators. But what, what, what does being more than allies mean? I, I guess we'll maybe find out. But before we get into that, who is joining me on this journey into academia today? That would be the one servant. I can't even. Nah, let's try that again. That one servant of Satania. Matt Barnes, hello. Lexi Mads, hello. Jaeger Pony, hello. Slapper360, hello. Debate Fly, hello. Black Belt for Christ, hello. Wade Whaleson, hello. Mike R, hello. The Asia Research Directorate, hello. Zalbla, hello. Mr. E, hello. Tall Person, hello. Uh, and then chat jumped because, of course, it did. Oh, thank you, Tall Person. Happy National Pie Day and Happy National Rhubarb Pie Day. A touch redundant, but I don't make the holidays. I think my father is the only one person I know who's ever liked rhubarb pie or ever asked for rhubarb pie i've never had rhubarb pie i don't know if it's any good i'm not particularly curious honestly i didn't think it looked that tasty the first time that i saw him have it so anyway jake tongue seth hello uh swirl blue hello dr kiever dam hello nathaniel taylor hello check your logic hello Brittany holland hello mike savage blarg Asian Hippie, hello. Mirai Vegeta, hello. And uh, let's see, I uh, already said hi to you guys. Everybody has already said hi to. Corey Suzuki, hello. Zeke Weiss, hello. Aspianti, hello. De Emperor W.R. Costin, hello. Peeps Cray, hello. Pip Bin, hello. Uh, Spittle Buggies, hello. Shio Gorath, hello. Uh, and then Chat Jump. Noble Valor, hello. Howard Welsh, hello. The Luke Skywalker 2, hello. Lurking Gopher, hello. Nicodemus X, hello. John Smith, Sprint Cars Rule, hello. Poker Pierce, hello. Little Mo Sislak, hello. Big Dave, hello. Data Wasteland, hello. Uh, if I'm a little off my game today, guys, it's because I am fighting a, a migraine. <laughs> you might wonder, gee, scribe, why would you undertake a TED Excellence, uh, a, an experience that usually breaks your brain, with an already sore head. Well, it's because I promised I would. And I mean to keep my promises. So, with that as a caveat, convenient, since convenient and caveat begin with the letter C, which is the bingo card we are on today. I put a poll up on Twitter, and today's bingo card is C. So get out your bingo cards, get them ready, so we can find out how educators must be more than allies. Per usual, I'll start off with a few seconds for sound test. You guys tell me if you can hear it, and then we shall proceed. I was a tomboy as a kid, which I know is shocking to everyone in this audience. I thought tomboy was now a offensive term. Did I miss that somewhere? Or maybe this took place before then. I don't know. Hey, you guys hear that? Sounds good as Asian Hippie. Sounds good as Matt Barnes, so on and so forth. Yes. Um, well, as a side note, I'm hoping the caffeine of the Dr. Pepper will have a positive effect on my head, but we'll see. Anyway, uh, our speaker was a tomboy as a kid, if you can believe it. All right. What that meant to me was that I didn't want to look girly. But parts of my personality were feminine, and I was okay with that. Uh -huh. This really confused people, and it still does. Okay. And this has what to do with uh, education. Anyway, childhood or family anecdote, circling free space, and childhood or family anecdote. Okay, we are two squares up on the board. Let's continue. 
I wanted to dress like a boy and play with adventure people and trucks, but I also wanted to talk about my feelings and know what everyone around me was thinking and feeling too. Yes, and all of these things are specifically inherent to one gender or the other. And, and boys obviously don't talk about their feelings. Boys are not empathetic or empathic, obviously. You know, it's a very, very distinct line that cannot be crossed in any way, shape, or form, whether you're a child or an adult, I guess. I still do. Mm -hmm. I walked up the stairs of bus number three with giddy hope. Uh -huh. I was excited to meet my new kindergarten classmates, get to know my new teacher, and learn all the stuff that my older brother already knew. Uh -huh. But as I earnestly looked into the crowd of kids, my eyes were not met with kindness and smiles, but with a lot of confusion and some glares. Ah, uh, yes, children. Children are, well, children. Confusion and glares. Okay, and... And even though my mom tried to hide my boyishness by attempting to make me look more feminine, the kids somehow knew that I was different. I want to go back to that picture real quick. Now we're at one minute exactly. I mean, admittedly, I'm no longer a kindergartner, but it looks like a girl to me. What, what I, I don't understand what... If that was her example of, here's a picture of the confusion kids experienced looking at me, I guess I'm missing it. Thank you, this is Kyle. Hello, chat people and scribbles. Hello, Kyle. Um, okay, so kids were mean when you were in kindergarten. Uh, I'd say welcome to the club, but that seems a little condescending. Different. Yeah. And that I didn't belong. Okay. I'm not exactly sure how they knew what I had not yet fully discovered. I'm not sure either, given the fact that you are mind reading and assuming motives. You knew what the kids thought. You know what? Those kids probably had very little focus on you because children are selfish little monsters uh, and you were not their main focus. Your self-consciousness, your, you know, self image problems probably weren't their concern. Uh, thank you, Redneck Ram. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Stop the train right now. First thing she needs to explain is how she had thoughts that complex and can remember them when she was five. Uh, you know what? It's her story. It's her anecdote. Is it an anecdote I believe? Do I believe that a kid can go to school and feel out of place and be self-conscious and be paranoid about what other people think about them? Sure because most kids are. Uh, how she wants to attribute those feelings that she's having and project them onto others, that's a square for the bingo card. So I don't disbelieve her anecdote until she gives me some kind of like completely outrageous example of someone interacting with her and going like, are you a boy or a girl? That kind of thing. But we'll see. Oh, wrong button. But kids seem to have a sixth sense about these type of things. No, they don't. They really don't. I mean, the only thing that they could probably sense is if you were awkward. You being awkward or standoffish or something else, maybe that affected them. They cannot read your gender identity issues at five, if you even had them at five. But whatever. And I didn't understand. Yeah. I got along with all my preschool friends. Uh -huh. Why was this any different? Oh, man, you know, the line between preschool and kindergarten, boy, them's the school of hard knocks, man. Why weren't the other kids as excited to see me as I was to see them? Uh, because the world doesn't revolve around you or any of us individually. I guess. I quickly sat down by myself in the front seat. Yeah. Within seconds, a girl got up from her seat at the back of the bus and walked past all the rest of the kids to sit down right next to me. <gasps> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Is this going to be a lifelong friend or a terrible enemy? 
Alicia was also starting kindergarten, but she grew up in the country, so she had automatically earned the respect of the kids. Why? What does growing up in the country have to do with earning the respect of the kids? And, and if we're talking about five-year-olds, I don't think mutual respect or social norms or personal boundaries and all these other things that you're attributing to this situation, I don't think they really apply here. Not on any meaningful level, not on a mature level like you are indicating. I Five. Okay, I, we, we are edging into anecdote I don't believe territory real quick. Her choice to come to the front and sit by me immediately shifted the entire energy of the bus. At five, you remember all of this, and this was the... Okay. I continued to be safe for the next 10 years whenever she was around. Wow. But when she wasn't, I got hit, kicked, spit on, harassed, and called names all throughout my elementary and middle school years. Because you were a tomboy? Um, okay. I need, okay, there, there's, there's one of two things are going on in my head right now regarding the bingo cart. Either this is anecdote that probably didn't happen, or this is leaves out vital context. Because depending on what she thinks or what she says was the cause of this, maybe I could believe it. I'd need more information. But if she does not provide that information, I have a hard time judging whether that you know, litany of events is true or not, which means leaves out vital context. So one way or another, we're probably getting a square. It all depends on what she says next to explain how she went a decade getting spit on and beaten up when her friend wasn't around just because she is who she is. As a highly sensitive tomboy with low self-esteem, I was easy prey. Because you were a tomboy, you were beaten up and spit on for 10 years. So from kindergarten through what? Uh, ninth grade, junior high, early high school, you were just constantly tortured and beaten up if Alicia wasn't around. I, uh, 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 okay. And even though I have learned that bullies are often the ones with unresolved trauma, it still feels awful to be treated like crap. I'm circling leaves out vital context. I can't tell without more information whether what she's telling us is true or not, or if the anecdote holds any weight, but certainly without more information, I can't, I can't judge that. So circling leaves out vital context. Let's go over the card real quick while I'm thinking about it. Marginalized marginalization, not yet. I mean, you could say tomboy that she was marginalized, et cetera. I, I wanna wait on that a little bit. Uh, collectivize his own demographic. Not yet. Feminism, no. Microaggressions, unconscious bias. Um, you could go for unconscious bias implicatively, uh, but I'll wait and see if she says it outright. Anecdote that probably never happened. Again, I, I kids can be cruel. I don't know the circumstances. She didn't give us enough information for me to weigh that. So I need, and she was talking like over the course of years. And so if she's if she's combining a whole bunch of individual incidents or people into constant streams of abuse, then I, I don't know. Contradicts own point or argument. She hasn't made an argument yet. Diversity and inclusion, not yet. Attempts to coin new buzzword, buzz phrase, no. Plays victim. Again, it's hard to say plays yet because she hasn't given us enough information, but we'll wait and see. Word salad, no. Benevolent condescension, no. A list, no. Patriarchy, no. Wage gap, no. Systemic institutional, no. Privilege, no. Self-vilification or wretchedness, uh, not, not yet. Equity, no. Weightless example, 
it depends on what our argument is, whether or not an example is weightless, we don't know yet. Uh, make something about race, sex, et cetera, for no reason, not really. And white supremacy, no. So, okay, let's continue. I learned that most people are afraid of what they don't understand and that this fear is often revealed through both words and actions. Wow, that's, uh, that's really profound. Um, a tomboy is not uncommon. I mean, whether you have a masculine-esque girl or an effeminate boy, these things are not uncommon. Now, granted, I don't know how common they were where you grew up, uh, but I, I don't think it's that alien of a concept that you have a girl who wears pants, you know? But, uh, okay, yes, you are very special. You were very victimized. And then... I was not allowed to be a tomboy anymore once... Okay, oh, look... That is not, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That is, that's not tomboy. None of these pictures you've shown us so far in any way, shape, or form reflect any notion to me of someone being a tomboy. Now, admittedly, hair length does not definitely define what is or is not a tomboy. It's about actions, it's about interests, and so on, but... Nothing about your appearance, either in kindergarten or in this picture, at all indicate to me that there would be any confusion over your gender or, or anything else. So I need more information. You're not giving me that information. I can't tell what is going on. So, all right, okay, all right. You know what? I will stipulate, as I'm rubbing my head, because not making my migraine any better. I will stipulate you had a tough time growing up. You trying to figure out what you like and your, your, your gender preferences and all that are probably very difficult. I'm sure it's so much more special than the rest of us, but okay. So I entered ninth grade. I had to wear feminine clothes and makeup, paint my nails, have long blonde curly hair and not leave the house without lipstick on. Uh, these were rules imposed on you by who? Okay, all right. So there are expectations on you when you were growing up that you did not feel comfortable with fulfilling. And eventually you got out of that because you became a, your own adult and made your own choices. Can you imagine for a moment, and I know this is rough. I know this is rough. Can you imagine for a moment that Nearly everybody goes through the exact same thing you've gone through just with different window dressing. Trying to discover your own identity, not being comfortable in your own body, trying to find a social group, feeling constrained and confined by the neighborhood you grew up in or the family you were raised by. Your experience is not unique. I mean, you might want to pretend that somehow you're special because your experience was all gender based or gender identity based, but I'm sorry, you're not that special. But where is this going again? Because the title had something to do with being an educator. I felt like I was in feminine drag. You felt like you were in feminine drag. Um... Um, feminine drag. Okay. The positive side effect of my new look was that I didn't get bullied anymore. Oh, that's all it took? Really? Because I didn't see anything in your kindergarten photo that, uh, relatively speaking, looked all that much different, but okay. So, so all it was was lipstick and hair and everybody who had tormented you your entire life just suddenly flipped the switch? Uh, Dr. Keeves says, list of the things the kid did to her. Uh, the kids did to her. I, maybe. I want to wait and see. She still hasn't gotten to like what we're here for yet. So I'm wondering if she has like a lesson plan or steps you can take or an actual slide. Since she's using slides, I'm wondering if we're going to get a slide with, a, with some bullet points or a checklist. The negative side effect was that pretending to be someone I wasn't 
caused me such deep depression that I made a plan to take my own life. And I'm sorry to hear that. I am. That's never a good story. But um, again, as, as morbid as it might be to say, that's not unique. And it has nothing specifically to do with your sense of your gender place or anything else. It's just growing up, unfortunately. Uh, thank you. This is Kyle. No scribe. It was just her that was bullied. No one else was bullied for, say, being a fat kid that was way into anime. Yeah, that never happened. Or being being bullied because you wore glasses or because you were quiet and stoic or just happened to be smaller than the other kids or something. No, that, that never happened. You know, all by herself. Fortunately, I had some friends and supportive adults who helped me survive. Well, you're lucky. I didn't have any friends. I was ostracized because I was too quiet and too meek at the time. And I was kind of stamped with the... Uh, uh, the, the the branding of the nerd and the geek and everything from the beginning. So um, lucky you. Alicia died several years ago of cancer. Oh. I told her the bus story a few months before she died, but she had completely forgotten about it. Yeah, probably because she was five. And re retaining memories from that age is not impossible, but okay. To her, it was just the right thing to do. Ah. But to me, it was everything. Okay. Alicia taught me the impactful difference between being an ally and being an advocate. Being an ally and being an advocate. The impactful difference between being an ally and being an advocate. Okay, what's the distinction? I wish this type of harassment was only a thing of the past but I've witnessed my black, indigenous, and students of color be seriously harmed by racism. Uh-huh. My LGBTQ plus students are verbally and physically assaulted. My non-Christian students are harassed and isolated. Okay, so Christian people are terrible, white people are terrible, and gender binary people are also terrible. Okay. And my students with disabilities or mental illnesses are often called names and are consistently underestimated. Yes, I'm sure. Everybody is treated terribly forever. Okay. All right. Well, what is your solution to bullying? Ally comes from the Latin word to bind to. Uh -huh. Allies are supportive and they're on your side. And again, what's the distinction between allies and advocates? You're getting to that, right? They help you to not feel alone and they tend to be curious, open, and kind. Uh, well, it depends. I mean, you can have allies between nations that are there only for their mutual benefit, not necessarily because they're friends, but because they have a common enemy or a common cause or something like that. Uh, do you want allies? Do you want friends? I, I guess I need to know the distinction between friend, ally, and advocate, because these seem to be gradations that she's highlighted so far. I'm not quite sure why you have to call them allies. It sounds so mechanical, doesn't it? They make people feel seen and respected. They make people feel seen and you know, some of this is your responsibility too, you know. Allies are wonderful and we need them. Uh huh. But it is not enough for educators to just be allies. I thought educators were supposed to be educators first and foremost. But okay. It's not enough for educators to just be allies, just teaching their students treating their students with respect and so on. What, what grade, I wonder, does our speaker teach? Okay, what else do they have to be? We need them to be advocates too. What does that mean? Advocate comes from the Latin word, add a voice. These are the folks who are fighting for people's rights and taking action. The ones who are speaking up in public spaces in support of causes and equity. 
Equity. Well, equity's on the board. Okay. Got that. Thank you, Redneck Ram. Oh, boy, all the leftist dogma has been internalized in this tomboy. It just makes me sigh at this point. <sighs> okay. You know, I get the teachers have a lot on their shoulders. I got a lot of respect for teachers. I've had some very good teachers in my day. Uh, some mediocre teachers, some bad teachers, but all the same people who put themselves out there to try in some way, shape, or form to educate the next generation or just anybody who's interested, depending. I have respect for the attempt. The execution is, of course, case by case. I think back to the teachers I had in elementary school, in the formative years, let's say, which is I, where I think our teacher is coming from, but I don't know what grade she teaches. So I'll just imagine somewhere between elementary school through junior high, if not something else. I try to think back as to what my sense of my relationship with my teachers were. And on the one hand, I looked up to them because, well, they were taller than I was. I also looked up to them because they were the authority figure in the room, and I knew I was there to learn something. I paid attention. Did I think of them as directly my friend. I guess when I was very young to a certain extent, but I didn't look at them like a friend, like a peer. I looked at them as a caretaker, you know, like most of the adults in my life that cared about me, my parents, my uh, uncles and aunts and things like that. Uh, I just looked at her and I'm, I'm saying her in the general because most of my teachers were female uh, as, you know, another adult that I was uh, being taken care of to a certain extent. You know, I extended that trust. And maybe I was lucky that way. I don't know. But the teacher didn't get involved in my personal self, you know. I, I wasn't analyzed by my teacher down to my nitty gritty. There was, for lack of a better phrase, a professional distance. They weren't the parent. They were the teacher. Uh, unless my behavior was somehow negatively impacting my learning or other kids in the classroom, uh, my personal life or what went on at home or what I was interested in outside of school and so on really didn't come up. I was there to learn. Here's your assignment. Do your stuff. I'll help you out if I can. You know, I, I don't know that I expected much more from my teachers than that as I grew up. You know, some teachers took more of an interest. Some teachers asked more questions, that kind of thing. But there was always that insulation, you know, because the roles we played were fairly well-defined. They weren't there to be my best friend, but they also weren't there to not care if I had a problem or, you know, you know, it was always like, if you have a problem, go, go to an adult you trust, right? A teacher or your parents or a counselor, something like that. So maybe there was a relationship that I formed with some of them more so than others, but they, they weren't crusading on my behalf or my personal interests or my personal sense of identity. And, and certainly from elementary school through junior high, my sexuality, whatever it was, was certainly nowhere on their agenda to deal with or to address outside of sex education for the sake of let's prevent unwanted pregnancy. So when I listen to speakers like our speaker today talking about their sense of role in education, it all sounds very alien to me. I try to think back to any example I can come up with of a teacher I had throughout my public education who in any way, shape, or form embodied any of what is being described here. And I honestly cannot think of a one. I cannot, which is why I have the hardest time trying to figure out what uh, teachers like our speaker are talking about. Why, why do they feel it is their responsibility to get this involved in the lives of children who are not their own? Because our speaker is not the parent of these children. Our speaker is not the one empowered to guide the children through life. 
the way that it sounds like she wants to. Maybe I'm just a traditionalist or something. Maybe I'm just too conservative for my own good, but they're not your kids is what constantly comes up in my head when I hear speakers like our speaker today. The people who are challenging xenophobia in school policies and in staff meetings, the educators who are writing articles and emails, creating support groups and working alongside our unions. Support is not enough. We also need to be willing to leave our comfort zones and stand up for all of the human beings who are being marginalized and oppressed. Marginalized marginalization, circling that on the board. Uh, why, why do you assume that everybody's being marginalized and oppressed? Who is doing the marginalization and the oppression? Uh, how do you distinguish someone who obviously needs help from someone who's obviously the villain? You're not giving us enough information. You need to give us some active examples. I, I ask for that a lot in TED Excellences, active examples. You know, an actual case study of something. Now, sometimes it's offered, rarely. And sometimes, oftentimes, when it is offered, it's fairly weak, but okay, you were bullied as a kid because you were different. I can accept that. I was bullied as I as a kid because I was different, or at least perceived to be, okay? I went through a suicidal period as well when I was young. A lot of kids do. Like I say, I can empathize with your experience. At the same time, though, I, I don't see it as special, and I don't see it as any more special because your issue was your gender identity versus my issue was just finding my place in the world or trying to figure out why I didn't fit in. But now you need to be an advocate. You need to be an ally to things, not people, to skin colors, to orientations. These things need help because these things are under attack. Okay. I want to acknowledge that there might be some allies in the audience right now who are feeling a little uncomfortable. Oh, why would they feel uncomfortable? I mean, they're allies. Uncomfortable with what? I see you. Do you? What does that mean? And I honor your feelings. You, you honor? How do you know what I'm feeling? We already circled mind reading assumes motives, but okay. I know it can be terrifying to put yourself out there and that you probably didn't sign up for this when you got your teaching license. <laughs> you know, that uh, many a truth is uttered in jest. You're right. Getting a teaching license doesn't mean you're signing up to become a community activist within your own classroom, nor does it entitle you to become such. But, okay, why would we feel uncomfortable? But I'm asking you to do it anyway. What? Do, wait, if I'm already an ally, then why are you asking me to do that? Or are you asking the people in the room who aren't allies, who are actively antagonizers? What? Minnesota's Commissioner of Education, Mary Catherine Ricker, recently reminded me that we can't expect students to conform to our comfort. Uh, well, that's true, because your comfort is not important. You're there to teach the kids. You're not there to guide them through life. You purportedly, depending on what kind of school you're in, uh, have an area of expertise, and you're to teach that. Unless you're doing general studies, then you teach the general studies. That's your job. You understand that you have a job to do. It's not a cause to do. Many of our students are scared and in pain. W why? And since they don't have the same fully developed brains, resources, or support systems that we have, then it is up to us to step into our own discomfort so that we can help them. What are you talking about? 
Why is this your responsibility? Are, are the parents a factor at all in these calculations of yours? D do you see yourself as supplementary to a child's growth or primary? Most educators learn pretty quickly that you can follow Bloom's taxonomy of learning and create all of the dynamic lessons in the world, but they will never truly work unless we first respect Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Okay, well, that is definitely a list. So I'm circling a list, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. For those of you listening in the car, she's put a slide up that has two different, let's say, triangle or pyramid hierarchies. We've got Maslow's a hierarchy of needs, self-actualization, esteem, love and belonging, safety needs, psychological needs, sorry, physiological needs, my, my mistake. And then on the other side, I'm not sure which one this is, but it goes down thus wise, create, evaluate, analyze, apply, understand, remember. Okay. Many of us have already heard that if we don't Maslow before we bloom and create environments where students feel safe, then there is zero hope of getting kids into their learning brains. Yes, you want to make a comfortable environment for kids to learn. That's why it's always warm and bright colors and so on. Yeah, no, I, yeah, okay. And then we're all stuck. When I help design an open Takata Learning Center, an alternative high school in Shakopee, Minnesota, from the ground up, I quickly learned what the students who had experienced educational and personal trauma needed to thrive. They desired inclusive spaces with soft lighting, seating options, snacks, basic school supplies, and artwork that represented a variety of cultures. Was there any, um, I don't know, teaching involved in any of this? Was there any like academic rigor? Was there any space between you and the kids' lives? And where were the parents again? They wanted to see themselves and what they were learning. They benefited from personalized, self-paced, voice and choice curriculum, and their engagement increased significantly when they could select text that piqued their interest. Uh, senior staff reporter and chief Florida correspondent Colleen Bernier wants me to know the second list on that chart was Bloom's revised taxonomy. Okay. I, I, I accept your correction. I still have no idea what it is, but then again, I'm not a teacher. Uh, yeah. So if you go to an alternative school where you can pick your own curriculum, you set the standards, there's no pressure on and on and on. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you'll have a great time. I'm sure you'll have a great time. I'm sure everyone thrives in a situation where there's very few expectations of them, where there's very little structure, where, God forbid, we put expectations on you because that would be offensive. Because, you know, the real world, the real world doesn't put expectations on you. No, 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 no. We're not preparing you for the real world in this scenario. We're preparing you for the dream world that we think should be against the reality of what just is life. But what do I know? Okay, so students can pick their own curriculum at your special alternative school. Great. I'm, I'm sure they all graduate with honors, right? All humans deserve to be called by their chosen pronouns and names. Oh, Lord. No, they don't. Nope. I can call Joe Biden a duty head until the end of time. He doesn't have any right to me calling him what he wants me to call him. And looking at somebody from across the room, I cannot know what their chosen pronouns of the moment are. So if somebody asks me where someone is, I will use the descriptive words that are easiest that come to me. Because talking about someone who's not around to hear it is not something I'm concerned with all that much. Unless I know you, unless I care, 
unless it's just demonstrably obvious to me. No, you don't have a right to that. No, you don't. And they should be able to use whatever bathroom makes them feel safe. <sighs> this is your importance, huh? This is your this is your advocacy. This is your being an ally. Okay. Too many of our transgender, non-binary, and gender non-conforming students are not eating or drinking during the day so that they don't have to use the bathroom at school. That is utterly bizarre. Okay, well, make all bathrooms unisex then. I mean, that's what you do at your alternative school, right? I mean, that really is the only way to do it. Just make all bathrooms unisex. Then you don't have to worry about debating over who's using what bathroom. You know, do the, uh, was the Allie McBeal method. So I, you, what, what was your solution in your school? Just anybody can use any bathroom they want? Okay, well, let's make them unisex. Why bother? I mean, if you're behind the door of the stall, it really doesn't matter what you are, does it? Not only does this cause horrible medical issues, but it also causes emotional pain. If you're not eating during the day, then yeah, I'm sure that causes medical issues. A 2018 national survey by the Human Rights Campaign revealed that 73% of LGBTQ youth have experienced verbal threats because of their actual or perceived LGBTQ identity. Yeah. You know, uh, I was never threatened or beaten up or something when somebody used a, I guess what you would now call a transphobic slur or a homophobic slur when I was a kid as an insult, as a denigration. That never happened to me. Oh, wait, yeah, it did. Right? Because I was small, because I was shy, because I was still a kid, you know, and bullies are bullies. It doesn't make it good. It doesn't make it meaningless. But kids are made fun of by other kids because kids are assholes. I don't know what to tell you. You're not describing anything that hasn't happened to every kid who's ever gone through public education. You're not special. And you're focusing completely on things that have nothing to do with who the kids are. And you're assuming that every kid who is quote unquote different is inherently a victim and needs your help. And you've gotta be the hero and on and on and on. Is that your role? As a teacher, as an administrator, certainly. You don't want to have kids beating up other kids. You don't want to have kids treating other kids with disrespect or in some way, shape, or form harming the environment and so on. I get that. I really do. But there's a line. There's a line between keeping order at your school and taking a hand at guiding kids in life lessons that are not yours to deal with. Where are the parents? What role do the parents have in your curriculum? Why are you not talking about the parents? It's not enough to tell kids that it gets better. Okay, well then what are you to do beyond that? What, what, what is your role then in solving this problem? We need to show them that we are making it better now. How? Because if you have a cure for, for bullying and people making fun of other people, <laughs> don't go on Twitter. As educators, we must protect them in our classrooms and in our schools. How? After I learned how to create an inclusive space, the next step was to speak out and stand up. You, an active example. Is this going to be an active example of what you're talking about? I needed to learn how to challenge my own biases and make sure that my thoughts and behaviors were in sync. 
Okay, well, it's not unconscious bias, but I'm going to circle it anyway because throughout this entire thing, she's been talking about people's expectations and mean words and everything else. So circling microaggressions, unconscious bias. Uh, diversity and inclusion, inclusion, sorry. She talked about an inclusive space. Circling that one. Um, I, hmm. I don't know if she said the word institutional or institution or systemic, but by the end of this, probably education system or something. We'll, we'll get there. I had to increase my understanding of all the ways I showed up with privilege and how that impacted the people around me. Privilege. All right. So you're, you're showing up with privilege because why? I mean, you were an oppressed, marginalized, beaten up, spit on individual your entire life. What privilege could you possibly possess? I replaced my defensiveness, perspective gaps, and judgment with curiosity. Uh -huh. I learned how to understand the difference between intention and impact. You didn't understand this with your experiences growing up? I mean, everything you told us about your growing up, sounded like it was the crucible within which you were refined into the perfect activist, the most empathetic person. And yet these are lessons you still had to learn by the time you became a teacher. What kind of person were you if you had not learned from your own experiences how to treat other people at that point? I let go of needing to always be the expert. I celebrated vulnerability and I encouraged authenticity in myself and those around me. And prior to this, you were encouraging deceptiveness and lies? Like, nothing of what you're saying makes any sense because you're just giving us abstractions. You're an educator. You created a school. Okay, what does your school do that is healthier and more productive than the regular public education system. Okay, the, the only thing I can think of so far that she's mentioned, or at least alluded to, because she didn't tell us exactly what she does, is the bathroom situation. Okay, so every student in your school can go to whatever bathroom, male or female, that they feel comfortable with. Okay, that is the only real life, substantive, I rate there, example that you've brought up so far. Everything else so far has been pablum. Everything else has just been platitude. When are we going to get to the meat of whatever your theory is? I surround myself with people who are willing to courageously hold up a mirror for me so that I can more easily see my mistakes. So you surround yourself with sycophants. You surround yourself with people who put you at the center of their lives. Wow, that's, uh, that's great. When the staff of Takata Learning Center pointed out to me that I had more intense escalations in my classroom than anywhere else in the building, I initially felt defensive. But More escalations. What does that mean? M more intense escalations? Sorry, I'm going to back up a little bit. When I think of intense escalations, I think of like verbal shouting matches or... I don't know. What is a intense escalation? When the staff of Takata Learning Center pointed out to me that I had more intense escalations in my classroom than anywhere else in the building, I initially felt defensive, but then I realized they were right. What? what? I wish I could circle leaves out vital context more than once, but I, what is an intense escalation? You're having fights with your students? That's the only thing I can imagine. If you don't tell me what that means, I, I'll just have to leave it to my imagination. But okay, so out of everywhere in the building, your classroom had the most intense escalations, whatever that means. All right, so how did you address this problem? I made it my growth goal and learned how to maintain a coaching strategy when things got chaotic instead of switching to an authoritative role that caused students to not recognize me anymore. So you were trying to maintain order in your classroom. 
a classroom within a school that you specifically built to have a very loose sense of what structure is and discipline and curriculum. W were you running up against the weaknesses of your own plan because you're trying to get something done, but you'd already instilled in your students the idea that they were the ones in control? Was maybe that the problem? That you effectively, with the spirit of your educational system or process, abdicated your authority as the educator to the students? Maybe that's what you're running up against. I can only imagine because you're not giving us any details. Thank you, Matt Barnes. Uh, Takata Learning Center, I want to go there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've never had that, by the way. I've never drank that before. But uh, okay, so you back down to your students' demands. You were trying to maintain order in your classroom, but you were, the, you were in the wrong for being, quote, unquote, an authoritarian. I'll tell you what, an educator, teacher in the classroom, expert on the subject at hand, that is an authoritarian posture. Getting a teacher's license makes you an authoritarian. Authoritarian is not inherently bad. Authoritarian is not inherently negative. Good teachers are authoritarians in their classrooms. But you've decided that being an authoritarian in your own classroom, in your own turf, that's bad. And everybody else said it was bad. So you back down. Okay. We learned together how to give our lizard brains time to cool off so that we could have meaningful and connecting conversations. You're not there to connect, you're there to teach. You're not there to have conversations, you're there to mentor. Discussions, debate, sure, but on an academic level. Are you a teacher or are you their friend? Are you an educator or are you a babysitter? Because you're blurring the lines and that's not necessarily a good thing. But then this is an alternative school, so what do I know? As a result, we improved our emotional regulation and distress tolerance. Emotional regulation and distress tolerance. <laughs> what? George Orwell, is that you? Retain more dignity, use conflict as an opportunity to get to know each other better, and became a whole lot more productive. Conflict opportunity. You, you ever hear somebody that like lists off a bunch of terrible things but has a smile on their face because they've categorized them as actual progress? You know, you, you ever see somebody that's so been been just sort of broken down? Uh, either by other people or by their faith in a broken system that the only way they can justify what they're doing is to put the biggest shine on it and say it's all good. You know, that cartoon of the little dog sitting in the giant room full of fire and saying this is fine. That's what that sounded like to me. Now, I, I cannot read our speaker's mind. I do not know what she is talking about because she's not telling us what she's talking about, but that's what it sounded like to me. My friend Alicia taught me how to have the courage to stand up for people who are being mistreated. I've leveled up since then and learned how to immediately address language and actions that are discriminatory towards students and educators. I would love to know uh, one of those instances. I'd like to know what you did to correct someone who used the bad word. I'd like to know an example or two of what you're talking about. I'd love to. We got a couple minutes left. You, you have time to give us some of those if you would. I'd appreciate it. You know, like, like I don't know, a teacher would give examples to a class. That are discriminatory towards students and educators. How to start, 
support groups for students, and how to advocate for equity by publicly supporting inclusive policies and laws. Such as? This is not easy, believe me. Oh, I, I'm sure it's not easy. I'm sure making your personal cause the center of all things and then having to correct yourself for your own behavior in your own school, in your own classroom, for trying to maintain order as a bad thing. I, I can imagine this is not easy. This is not easy, believe me. The roadblocks I've faced as an educational advocate have been daunting and draining. Such as? Those who benefit from systems of oppression will try and stop you from dismantling the structures that give them power. Oh, for crying out. Okay, systemic institutional, circle in that one. Do you want to give us an example of the individuals who are halting or hindering your progress in order to maintain their power? Would you, would you like to, man, you don't even have to give us a name. It's fine. You know, I can appreciate not giving it. Can you give us an example? One example, one active example of what you're talking about? Because everything so far has been a trust me story. And honestly, I don't trust you because you're not leveling with us. You're withholding information. BG says the parents. You know what? I could believe it because she's not telling me different. They are furious when we advocate for the very people that they need to stay oppressed. And we can become targets of that anger. Like... Which means there might be some times in your life when you don't have the emotional strength to be an advocate. It's okay to take mental health breaks from this work. I don't know if mental health and this work really go together. As long as you do whatever self-care you need to do in order to come back. Because discrimination does not appear to be stopping anytime soon, and we need you. I got bad news for you. Discrimination or what you decide to perceive as discrimination, because I don't know, will never, ever go away. Especially, especially if you come to the table with a foregone conclusion about who in the room is a good person and who in the room is a bad person based on their race, their orientation, or their religious beliefs. She brought up the religious aspect of it. So um, tell me of your biases. Remember your biases? Remember how you went all the way through your entire life as a victim of discrimination and bullying and everything, got to the point of being the teacher in the classroom, and your classroom was the one with the most intense escalations? Why was that? How could you get that far in your storied career, building your own school under your own dogma, and yet you still be the bad guy? How'd that happen? Tell me about your privilege. I still haven't heard what your privilege is. Do I expect to be told these things? No, I'm just being rhetorical and snarky. As an advocate, you have to be prepared to make mistakes. <laughs> Um, um, as a human being, you have to be prepared to make mistakes, whatever you're doing. doesn't matter if you're an advocate or just the mailman. You, you, you cannot be serious that some, some of these things are like life lessons that you should just know by putting your hand on the back of your neck and saying, am I warm there? You know, most of us, not everybody, some of us are psychopaths or anything else and so on, but most of us are not fans of seeing someone else picked on. Most of us are not fans of seeing injustice done in front of us. Most of us know that in life you're going to make mistakes. And either you dwell on them 
and let them conquer you. Or you use them as learning opportunities to say, I'm not going to do that again. That's where wisdom comes from, applying your past mistakes or successes to future events. Why, why is it that I feel like our teacher is learning things late in life that most people learn in elementary school? A lot of mistakes. Yeah. I still regret all of the times I did not stand up for others in the ways that I should have. Such as... This is why it is essential to create a safe and supportive team so you can check in and be checked when you have some learning to do. Like... I can say with 100% certainty that the positive effects are worth it. Our kids are watching us. If we stand up for ourselves and for others, then we can all feel like we matter. And I want everyone to experience that feeling. Do you? Because you've had some pretty subtle antipathy for certain demographics. I don't know. My journey as a gender nonconforming lesbian has had some twists and turns. I've been harmed as both a kid and as an adult. You and every other human being on the planet. I don't care who you sleep with. I don't care what you do in your free time that has nothing to do with your educational responsibilities. I'm wondering, what is your philosophy on education? You've given us nothing but abstractions. You've not told us what you do. You've not told us what policies you institute versus a public education system. Your sexuality is irrelevant. Do you understand that? Your sexuality is irrelevant to your role as an educator? Do you get that? I don't know. You know, I... I don't remember a moment. I don't remember a time during my growing up where my teacher's love life was ever, ever a subject of discussion or curiosity on my part. It never came up. Nobody cares. Thank you, Matt Barnes. No, Scribe, you're supposed to bring your whole self to work. Yeah, yeah, your whole self to work. Oh, boy. Okay, if I sound a little more irritated than usual, I don't know if I do or not. I'm my own worst witness. Might be because of the migraine. My wife and I were spit on in a Target parking lot. I've been assaulted by strangers, family members, and intimate partners, and hit hard enough in the head by a group of students who were led by the school's homophobic dean to receive a traumatic brain injury. What? Wait, 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 what? What? The dean of students led a gang of students to punch you in the head and give you brain damage. I I'm going to back up and play that again real quick because I... Uh, thank you, Ebony Williams. What teacher discusses their love life with their students? Uh, okay, I, I need to give a quick correction. In my public school days, never came up. I did have a teacher or two in college who were very open about their after-school activities, let's say. So I'll just make that caveat because that's not inherently true across the board. There was a certain point at which you have adults in the room, and they felt, I guess, comfortable being that open about certain things. Uh, thank you, Snubberth. All that happened to her minus the dean happened to me alone. Boo-hoo, lady. I had an entire township label me a school shooter over video games. Let's back up. I want to hear that story again. A feeling. My journey as a gender nonconforming lesbian has had some twists and turns. I've been harmed as both a kid and as an adult. Harmed as both a kid as an adult. Okay. My wife and I were spit on in a Target parking lot. Your wife and you were spit on in a Target parking lot. 
I've been assaulted by strangers, family members, and intimate partners. You've been assaulted by strangers, family members, and intimate partners. And hit hard enough in the head by a group of students who were led by the school's homophobic dean to receive a traumatic brain injury. So again, the homophobic dean of students leading a mob of students punched you in the head to give you brain damage. Uh, thank you, Matt Barnes. I'll take shit that never happened for $500, Alex. All right. That is the first story, the first anecdote with enough specificity to it for me to weigh whether or not I believe it. The dean of students led a gang of students to attack you and punch you in the head to give you a traumatic brain injury. <sighs> that is so specific. That is so very specific. And it's also something that is verifiable or unverifiable, depending. Do I believe it? I, 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 I don't. I, I don't believe it. Not, not with those details. It just doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't clock. It just doesn't. Uh, can I believe that she's been assaulted in life? Yes. Can I believe she's been abused in life? Yes. That the dean of students of a school directed other students to beat her in the head to give her a brain injury. Or, or with the result being a brain injury. Got a hard time believing that one. A circling anecdote that probably never happened. Now, just because, you know, I'm still a human being. If it turns out that there's some way to tell whether or not this story was true, if it turns out to be true, well, then I stand corrected. But that sounds beyond the beyond. Which is why I am unable to memorize this talk and I have to read this script. Uh, if you say so. But my experiences have also helped me to support, understand, and advocate for students and staff members who do not feel accepted, valued, or seen. I know what it feels like to have someone who is supposed to care about you cause you harm. How do you know what the kid... Okay, and here's, here's, where, here's where it kind of diverges, because if she's running an alternative school that doesn't operate like, you know, what I imagine public schooling to be, Maybe all the teachers are counselors. Maybe everything is structured so all the teachers are involved in the children's lives to that extent. But I ask again, where are the parents? For all your personal tragedies and catastrophes, what has that got to do with the kids? You've had a rough life. You know what it is to be mistreated, marginalized, and so on. Okay, are you sure that you are not projecting onto others an assumption of quality of life that they might not necessarily possess just because you're paranoid about the world? Research and experience teaches us that kids who have been victims of trauma will build resiliency only when they are believed and supported by an adult. Why do you believe that children automatically are victims of trauma? I mean, every kid in your school cannot be a victim of bullying because somewhere in there, there's the bully. And every kid in your school who happens to either not be white, not be straight, or not be Christian, from your own estimation earlier, is not inherently a victim of trauma. Do you assume your kids are trauma victims just by looking at them? 
You haven't given us anything specific about what you're talking about, what you have in place, what you do. How do you assess a new student? Okay, let's, let's just say for a second, a student of color joins your school. All right. How does that process work? What, what is the intake process for a student of color at your school? You don't know anything else about them. You, you don't know their orientation. You don't know their home life, whatever. They're just a not white kid because that seems to be your focus. Okay. What, what happens then? What is the admissions process to your school? Do you do a deep dive counseling session to find out their innermost workings? so you can know what safe space to put them into? Or do you just treat them like a kid and let them grow and not be judgmental and just teach them what they need to know to move on in the world? I wish I knew the answers to these questions. It'd be far more enlightening. Even if I didn't agree with it, it'd be more enlightening to know what her perspective on education is. But so far, nothing. I can tell you firsthand that trauma-sensitive environments make learning much easier for everyone. I don't care about your firsthand. At this point, I have heard so much about you, 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 you. I haven't heard a thing about education. I haven't heard a thing about what teachers at all are supposed to do differently compared to what you say they're not doing. Your firsthand experiences at this point are irrelevant to me. You've got two minutes left. Two minutes. Are you going to tell us what you are doing, how you do it, what you say the solutions are to these problems? Because so far it's been nothing but a litany of complaints and complaints and complaints. And I am not dismissing the possibility that she's had a rough life. But at a certain point, when you have a talk called educators need to be more than allies, you need to get to that part where you tell us how it works. And you haven't. And the only way to build these environments is through active advocacy. What does that mean? Every single day and for every single heart. What does that mean? I started my life as a victim, grew into an ally, transformed into an advocate, and am now an activist alongside the incredible staff of Outfront Minnesota. So Outfront Minnesota, whatever that is, is an activist organization. Okay, what is Outfront Minnesota? We are one of the largest LGBTQ state equity groups in the country. Okay, so again, you're an activist group. What does that have to do with educators? What does that have to do with teaching students? What? As the Director of Educational Equity, my program is working to decrease inequity and increase LGBTQ plus inclusivity in classrooms, schools, districts, and youth organizations. How? How, how do you do that? We take an intersectional approach and believe that the skills you build to employ equitable strategies will help every student thrive. Circling word salad. I mean, if not for that last statement alone, then for the amalgam of everything that's been said so far, that's been nothing but abstractions and no specificity. So, okay. I wish I could go back and tell my five-year-old self that she will not only learn and grow from her experiences, but that she will also be given countless opportunities to help other people to feel safe and seen too. I, I, I thought it's not enough to tell kids it gets better. That she will become a social worker for at-risk kids. That she will design and open a school for students who feel like they don't belong in other spaces that she will become the first out LGBTQ Minnesota State Teacher of the Year. Boy, oh boy, don't break your arm patting yourself on the back there. Uh, thank you, Zed Almighty. Ranch for the word salad, please. Yeah.
this this talk isn't about education. This talk isn't about strategies for becoming a better teacher or even something more than an ally. This is my life was terrible and I'm a hero now and I'm building up my own self-esteem because I still feel uncomfortable with myself. Even at this late date in my life, I still feel uncomfortable with myself. Okay. That she and the 2019 Kentucky Teacher of the Year, Jessica Duenas, will stand up against discriminatory policies and actions by being the first teachers to ever boycott a visit with the President of the United States. Oh. It's about Trump. Got it. That she'll be given the opportunity to make school safer for every kid. Uh, except for your classroom that had the most intense escalations of anywhere else in the building. I guess. And that she will get to stand up on this very TED Talk stage in New York City. New York City! And share her story. Oh, and that she will never have to wear dresses, put on lipstick, or have long, blonde, curly hair ever, ever again. Thank you. Really? Really? A standing ovation? A, a 13 minute, 50 second long me, 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 woe is me, poor is me, me, me story. Cloaked in the promise of something to do with education or in how to become a better teacher. At no point were the parents of students mentioned. At no point was any specificity of process mentioned or technique or initiative, or program, nothing, nothing. <sighs> okay, all right, that commentary is effectively concluded. Let's go over the bingo card. This is what I have so far. I'm gonna go over it once. And then I will go to chat. And if you guys have any arguments for squares to be circled, I'll take them then. Collectivizes own demographic. Yes. Uh, in at least a few instances, she classified herself as, you know, LGBTQ, gender nonconforming, and so on. So circling that one. Feminism. No, she never brought up feminism. So I'm not going to circle that one. Contradicts own point or argument. I don't know what her argument was. I don't know what her point was. Uh, kids need to be given the space to learn. Kids need to be treated with respect. Okay. But nothing. There, if I missed it, if there was an argument there for something worth, you know, analyzing, you'll have to let me know, chat, because I don't know. Attempt to coin new buzzword buzz phrase. Okay, she used a couple of phrases in there that were very corporate speak, like emotional something or other and whatever. I don't know if I can call those new buzzwords or buzz phrases because she only used them once. She never used something to the effect of something I like to call blah, blah, blah. So I'm hesitant to circle that one because I don't know that they're actually new. They might be obscure, but I don't know that they're new. Plays victim, yeah. Um, for, for anything that she might have experienced in life for real, there's a certain point at which you draw the line and say, I'm an adult now and I'm going to stand up for myself. And in a lot of cases, she brought up things that just don't make any sense. And she's still standing up there like she's the victim of something. I don't doubt that she's been made fun of. I don't doubt that she's been mistreated. But uh, benevolent condescension. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you're LGBTQ, if you are uh, black, indigenous, if you're non-white, if you're non-Christian, apparently 
you're just automatically in need of protection because you're obviously being oppressed, marginalized, or mistreated in some way, shape, or form. So given that I just circled that, I think you know what that means. Bingo. What? Of course! Our first bingo. Moving on. Patriarchy? No. She didn't bring up patriarchy. Uh, let's see. Wage gap? No, she never brought up pay or anything like that. Self-vilification or wretchedness? Uh... And the only reason I hesitate is because was she actually vilifying herself or was she just painting herself further into the, the victim frame? She talked about her privilege at one point. Uh, she talked about how she needed to correct herself because of the intense escalations. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think, did she, well, I mean, she did kind of put herself as part of the problem with her own biases and so on and so forth. Yeah, okay. You know what? I'll circle that one. It, it, it comes in just by a hair, but I mean, there, there, was, there was, I guess it was a combination of things. Uh, let's see. Weightless example. <sighs> Truth be told, the majority of her stories about her own bad experiences, they had nothing to do with students. They had nothing to do with education. They had nothing to do with being a teacher. It was all just, uh, I'm sorry, I, I know this is a, I know this sounds like a very uh, dismissive way of putting it, but I don't have a better phrase right now. It was all a sob story. Even if it was all true, it was irrelevant to the purported subject of the talk. So you know what that means. Ooh, that's a bingo. Right? <laughs> yeah! That's our second bingo. Okay, uh, make something about race, sex, etc., for no reason. Okay. She had a reason. Kind of. I mean, she never gave any specifics on what she was talking about. So, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to be generous here. She started out the talk by saying that she lives in a world where every kid who is LGBTQ, every kid who is black or indigenous or non-Christian is a victim, okay? So everything that she's talking about in her perspective of having been a victim for her entire life up until her adulthood from the Dean of Students uh, has to do with your gender conformity, your race, and so on and so forth. Was there a point at which she brought up something that was a non sequitur regarding race, sex, etc.? I can't think of one, not off the top of my head, but then, you know, my head's a little sore right now. So if I've forgotten something, if there's an argument for it, let me know in the chat in a second. Lastly, white supremacy. Okay, she brought up, there's the implication, obviously. If she's saying that everyone who isn't white, she talked about privilege uh, and so on, and this system and those who would stand in the way of equity, da, 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 and the systems of, yeah, you know, it, maybe I'm being too generous here, but in the amalgamation of everything that she said and was implying over the course of this entire talk, uh, yeah, and Donald Trump, yeah, so. Bingo. What? Of course! So, triple bingo. And uh, that is the card as I see it right now, guys. So, if you have circles that need to be squared, circles that need to be squared, boy, oh boy. I, after this, I'm laying down for a bit. Do you, if you think there are squares that need to be circled, if you have arguments for things that have not yet been marked, put them in the chat now. Be sure to tag your comment with my name so I can 
see it amongst everything else. Uh, Dr. Keeve, in the beginning when she suddenly brought up black and indigenous people of color, make something about race for no reason. <sighs> Again, in the world of the talk, her argument is that these demographics are inherently victims. And she belongs in that categorization. And she sees herself as advocate and ally to anyone who has been bullied, marginalized, and so on. So if that is the world of her talk, then there was a reason she brought it up. Like I said, maybe I'm being too generous here, like I am in so many cases, but the question is, for no reason, was it a non sequitur in the course of the talk? I don't think I can say so. Again, if you have an example otherwise, give me one. We're all about examples here today. Uh, let's see. Uh, Snub Earth, she ended up being, she ended this being proud of her lack of feminine stereotypes. Yes. Yes. But, and again, I know I'm being very generous to the speaker here, but I'm trying to be fair. Not conforming to the expectations of the power structure, being who you want to be, not being oppressed anymore by other people, so on and so forth, was a main part of her talk. It did not go along with the subject, but it was a main part of her talk. So for her to take a you know, call back victory lap to her sense of her own comfort in school and life. It wasn't for no reason. I know people are gonna be mad at me, but you, you really gotta, this is, this would be a quadruple bingo. This is, so I'm being very, very sticky on this one. You got to give me something that there's no argument. And I can find an argument for that one because she talked about it a lot as inherent to her perspective on why she needs to do the things that she does. So there was a reason for it. Uh, even if it was an awkward closer, it was still a reason. Uh, Assassin of the Gray, is there a bid for sympathy square? No. No, that's, that might be too subjective depending on the talk and take up a space that would never get circled. We had that problem with the uh, should not be in the job that they hold kind of thing. Because that was, you know, so, some were more clear cut than others. Most times it was off or they never brought up what their job was. Uh, Mike R. She was singling out straight white men as people who are the oppressors make something about race. Again, for no reason. She's, she's already categorized certain people as inherent victims. Therefore, there has to be an inherent villain. I'm not saying that doesn't make her a racist or a sexist. I'm just saying that for the sake of the talk, was it for no reason? She had a reason. Uh, Mr. Scott, can we party watch Abraxas after this? Yeah, so I, a lot of people on the on Twitter were asking like, or making jokes about the, the title, Praxis and, uh, Praxis and Allies. I tried to come up with something catchy that held the word allies in it. And the only thing I kept come up, coming up with was Axis and Allies, the game. And of course, I can't use axis and allies as then we're talking about. But praxis, the definition thereof, is about practice and learning things and mastering things, which is kind of like teaching and schooling and education. So that's kind of where that goes in, more or less. Slapper 360, how's your head? Uh, not great. Uh, <laughs> to be honest, after this, I am going to go lie down for a while. Uh, depending on how long this goes, we'll see if I'll be up for Lords of the Night tonight. Uh, Mr. E, if her reason was to lie or to poison the well, that nullifies the reason, Scribelite. <sighs> no. No. Like I say, I have to take the presentation as it is, the world in which it's created for the presentation. And she had a reason to bring up that stuff. Like I say, I don't agree with it. I don't necessarily agree with her logic behind it, but it has to be for no reason. It has to be like like the uh, other talk we had where the lady went to the neighborhood and she brought up the, how nice the neighborhood was 
given that she was going to a mental health call and then never brought up the neighborhood again or the class the person lived in or anything, right? It, it was a non sequitur, brought up class and, and uh, wealth or whatever that had nothing to do with the story. I mean, the, the story could have been taking place in, uh, you know, uh, high class mansion territory or the worst part of town territory and it would have been exactly the same. Uh, that was that was part of the reason that 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 made sense. It was just out of the blue. Nothing was kind of out of the blue here. Everything was structured around her feeling oppressed uh, because of uh, what she is or what she likes to do or how she likes to comport herself and her empathizing with other people who she sees as inherently out of place. I know I'm being a stickler here, but you got to give me a real home run for a, a bingo. That's all. Uh, Sassan the Great, I have been looking. There are no reports anywhere of dean of students attacking lesbian teacher in Minnesota or any search engine. Well, she didn't tell us it happened while she was a teacher. She just said that at some point in her adult life, it happened. She didn't give us enough information to say when this occurred. I assume at least in college or, at a, or I guess at a school she worked at. As far as I can recall, and I'm not going to rewind, when she told the story, you know, she she encapsulated the stories about her wife and her at the Target parking lot and being attacked by the dean of students within being from a child to an adult. When in her life that took place, I don't know. Was she a teacher at that time? Was she a student at a college? No idea. Couldn't say. Uh, but again, it sounds it sounds unbelievably bizarre. Like I say, if it turns out to be true, I, I will post a retraction or something at some point in, in a future TEDx. But I just, and besides which, it, it doesn't contribute to a bingo on here. So even if it was uncircled again for the sake of the card, it wouldn't mean a whole lot. Uh, Snubber, subscribe like you might be interested to know he's a educator for Biden. Uh, I'm not surprised. Uh, Ryan R., your headache was rigged from the start. Well, I've had it since I woke up this morning. So you're pretty much right. Uh, Slapper 260, she said she was a gender nonconforming lesbian. I, she, she can say whatever she wants about herself. It means nothing to me. Uh, that is a paradox, Scribe Light. I, I don't disagree. That is a paradox. Paradox is not on the card, so whatever. Uh, the one, the other choice, I think feminism or patriarchy for the hair and dress comment, Scribe Light. Um, Comfort with fashion choices and things like that. I don't. I, I'm now. I, I. I don't. I don't mark that up as inherently patriarchy or something else. She doesn't want to conform to a particular gender. She talked about how she had feminine sides and male sides, and so she's somewhere in between. If she feels that way, that's fine. I. I don't care. Uh, she wasn't, or at least as far as I can tell, aside from systems that were oppressing diversity and so on. She never talked about particularly gender-based systems of oppression. She talked about her homophobic uh, dean of students or something, but yeah, I don't. That's that's again, guys. Part of the reason I'm not trying to be over generous for the sake of being generous. The problem is she never got specific with what, with, with, what, with what she was talking about. She just kept giving us abstractions over and over and over again, generalities, hypotheticals. It's difficult for me to say that she was talking about patriarchy or feminism because she never told us. <sighs> Let's see. Mystery. We do have a paradox square. It's called Contradicts Own Point, Scribe Light. Uh, the, the specifics of how she sees herself or what her sexuality is, it, that's not the argument. She wasn't arguing. I mean, she made herself the, the center of her talk but she was arguing about the treatment of students. But she never gave us any specifics, so I can't tell if she contradicted herself because I don't know what her argument was. She said that public education did X wrong for her in school, but then she didn't tell us what she does at her school that's right. She had to argue for a better way of doing things, but she never told us what was going wrong and how she's working to correct it. That's that's why I can't say she contradicted her own point or argument. She didn't get us to a point, and she didn't make an argument. Treating people with respect. If that was her argument, well, sure. Great. And? 
Uh, my car says, okay, I give up. I'm not, guys, I'm not trying to be obstinate for the sake of being obstinate here. It's just that at this point, I need a really good argument for no reason out of the race, sex, et cetera stuff. There has to be a non sequitur. And as, as, as infuriating and as frustrating as her talk was and not giving us specifics, nothing she brought up wasn't inherently separate and apart and uninvolved with everything else she was talking about, even in the abstract, which is all we had. So, all right. Well, guys, I think I'm going to call it there. If for no other reason, then I need to take a rest because my head's hurting me. But regardless, guys, we got to a triple bingo, which is not very often an occurrence on the show, which that's something to say, I think. Did we learn anything? No. I learned something about our speaker, I think, maybe. It's hard to tell because I doubt her credibility, but you know, whatever. It is what it is, I guess. I was hoping for something more educational about education, but you get what you get. Everyone, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me for this one, as difficult an experience as it was. Thank you so much for your attendance. Thank you so much for your participation and argumentation. Even if you don't always convince me, I appreciate it all the same. You know how often you've convinced me otherwise. And everyone who donated, thank you. Thank you so much for your generosity. I really do appreciate it, especially given the current circumstances of the world. It is uh, uh, humbling very much. Uh, if you'd like to hear more from me, fingers crossed tonight at least, or The Ranting Monkey or Satsu Two Cents, you can find all three of us, again, fingers crossed, tonight on The Ranting Monkey's channel at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern for The Lords of the Night, where we will talk about the news of the day, news stories you submit, what we've been up to on the internet, and then your questions and comments. Everyone, again, thank you for joining me. I hope you are all having a good Saturday. I hope you're all safe and well. If you're not well, please get well soon. I know I'm going to try to. And I'll see you on the next one. Bye, guys.